Uh, I am Dr. Pragya Chaudhary, Senior Project Associate at DST CPR IASC. On behalf of DST CPR, I would like to welcome everybody joining us today for the fourth part of our lecture policy series. And joining us today is our esteemed guest from Australia, Professor Vedi Venkat Krishna. Professor Krishna is currently professorial fellow at the School of Humanities and Languages at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. He is an expert in science and technology policy studies, history and sociology of science and technology, and innovation studies. With a career that spans over 30 years, Professor Krishna has donned on many hats over the years as a researcher, teacher, and consultant. For more than 20 years, he has been a professor in science policy and chair at Center for Studies in Science Policy at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. And he has held several visiting faculty positions, uh, including at National University of Singapore, McGill University, Canada, and United Nations University, Japan. He also has been a member of various expert committees and been consultant at UNESCO, OECD, ILO, and other international agencies. He has contributed to World Science Report 98 and UNESCO Science Report 2005 and to the ILO in 2001 for its program on the informal sector. He has served as an expert on European Research Council's Grand Challenges and European Union Brussels-based networks on research and innovation policy since the 90s. In 2019, he got elected as the Fellow of the Royal Society of New South Wales, Australia. Now, without any further ado, I would like to invite Professor Krishna. Please take the floor. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Pragya. And uh, let me also uh, take this opportunity at the outset uh, to thank uh, Dr. Namdiyo and Dr. Abhinandan, Abhinandanan, in fact. And uh, I'm really delighted to uh, be part of uh, and uh, give this talk at the uh, DST uh, Center, uh, which uh, I deem it as a very important center. And uh, this has been a very good uh, a center in terms of uh, uh, giving a platform for discussions on science, technology, and policy on uh, from time to time. And uh, I've been following this uh, center's uh, website and uh, uh, heard many of the, some of the lectures, uh, which were very, very useful. Uh, without further ado, I think, let me uh, get into my uh, talk today. And uh, let me try to share my files. Uh, yeah, you uh, you are able to uh, see the uh, slide. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, well, today I am uh, planning to talk on science, technology, and innovation policies for development in India. And what I'm going to do, these are some of my reflections on the post-independence era. And uh, as the title suggests, uh, I take a, uh, a slightly a historical perspective. And uh, two thirds of the lecture, which goes into uh, the kind of the, con uh, the history uh, in the post-independence period. And last one third of the lecture, I will deal with the contemporary uh, situation. Uh, well, over the years, uh, uh, I have contributed uh, several books uh, from uh, Bhatnagar on science, technology and development, uh, which is a historical one. Uh, then 12 countries case studies on the scientific communities in the developing world, uh, published from the SAGE. Uh, at the same time, I did scientific communities and the brain drain. In 2008, I did uh, uh, science, technology and policy and the diffusion of knowledge. Uh, uh, this is again a 12 country uh, case studies. And there are other books which I will uh, come to uh, later on. Uh, but today, much of my talk is based on the kind of the a publication uh, uh, which uh, some of you uh, have sent to some of the colleagues at the center. 
this was on India at 75, Science, Technology, and Innovation Policies for Development, published in the journal Science, Technology, and Society. And uh, I happen to be also the editor-in-chief of this journal, which was launched in 1998, uh, which is published from the SAGE. And currently, it has the SACI impact factor of 1.173, which is a modest one. Uh, well, of course. So much of my talk uh, is based on this uh, paper, longish paper of 20,000 words, which I did uh, in this journal. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, well, uh, to begin with, uh, on the eve of independence, if we look back uh, in terms of the uh, whole situation, uh, from 1876 to 1940s, 1876 is a very historic period when Indian Association of Cultivation of Science was launched uh, in Calcutta, from where in 1930s, uh, Dr. Sir C. V. Raman uh, uh, got the Nobel Prize. Uh, 1876 to 1940s witnessed a break from the colonial science towards establishing uh, scientific institutions and infrastructure outside colonial scientific enterprises. As you all know, there were more than a dozen colonial scientific enterprises, uh, but this period has given a break from the colonial science uh, uh, towards uh, uh, what was a flourishing Swadeshi movement in science towards uh, uh, promoting science and the nation building with a series of institutions and a lot of the infrastructure was created. Uh, from the 1920 onwards, we see, of course, Indian Science uh, uh, Congress Association was formed as early as uh, 1914. Uh, after that, uh, from 20s, you, have, you will see a series of uh, infrastructure in science and technology uh, formed by some of uh, early uh, Indian elite scientists, the science journals, specialist groups in mathematics, uh, in uh, plant physiology, in physics and chemistry, chemistry uh, PC ray was there, uh, led to the formation of what is known as the nascent uh, Indian national science community. Uh, no other developing country under the colonial contest has done this. And this was one of the greatest achievements of India before 1947. So this is the main point I would like to make. Secondly, we then we come to the National Planning Committee, uh, a precursor to the Planning Commission and currently which is called the NITIO. Uh, here, uh, there was a whole lot of scientific elite like Eman Saha, uh, C.V. Raman and several others, P.C. Ray, uh, were involved along with uh, people like Nehru, Bose and others, uh, which led to the whole discourse on the science organization and the SNT based industrialization for independent India. Uh, this was an important uh, a kind of a discourse which went on almost for about uh, uh, two decades uh, before independence. Uh, then just before independence, we will come to know the government of India invited A.V. Hill uh, to report uh, on the uh, post-war and uh, post-independent uh, uh, science and technology organization. And uh, he has produced a fantastic report on the science and uh, technology in India in 1945. And this report is a kind of a landmark in terms of uh, where the whole blueprint was given, which was accepted by the Nehru and uh, Nehru as the first prime minister of India. And even the Congress manifesto supported the Nehru's vision in 1945. Uh, of course, uh, when all these uh, events were going on, uh, there were also people like Emin Saha, uh, who developed a critique uh, of uh, a science and uh, science organization because basically he critiqued against the A.V. Hill model because the A.V. Hill model, which was accepted by Nehru's uh, uh, Congress party and the independent India, uh, brought all the uh, scientific and technological organizations, including those SNT organizations which were under the colonial uh, contest, under the government and with a science minister and much of the resources were placed in this uh, kind of the public domain in terms of the governmental science and technology uh, institutions. For which Saha was, became quite critical and uh, in his uh, journal, which he edited himself on science and culture. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, M.N. Saha's science and culture uh, journal of 1938 to 1945 uh, uh, you will find uh, 
is, is one of the best uh, discourses on the science uh, policy you will find uh, in this journal in the pages of the 1938 and 1954 is the time when he departed. Uh, basically, on the eve of independence, there were uh, three main models of SNT organization. One was the Nehruvian model, the way we will report it was accepted. And secondly, MN Saha talked about uh, a kind of a new model where uh, scientific research was also to be placed within the academic uh, uh, sector. And thirdly, there was a Gandhian model, which was basically in terms of the whole decentralization of science and technology development. Uh, there were other uh, kind of uh, plans which were there. Uh, Gandhian plan, MN Roy's people plan, Visveshwaraya also gave a model in terms of the whole decentralized model. But it was the triumph of Nehruvian model, which was accepted uh, for the independence. So when we come to the dawn of independence in the post-47 period, uh, the demise of Gandhi gave a relatively a free hand to Nehru to chalk out a trajectory of India's development and the organization of science. A contrast to Gandhi's critical stance over modern science and technology, uh, uh, remember Gandhi was not anti-science or anti-technology as it put forward in some of the literature, but he was very critical about the whole centralization and the a huge modern science and technology. He had a, a different uh, alternative plan in terms of the decentralized science and uh, technology for development and also the whole developmental process for India. Uh, contrast to Gandhi's critical science uh, stance over modern SNT, Nehru's modern secular image and his unquestioned support of science was widely accepted. Uh, Nehru was one of the principal architects of modern India and through his enduring commitment to science, a leading figure in the formation of India's science policy and practice. This is how he was described by David Arnold, who is one of the great writers on South Asia. A uh, role of Nehru and his unbound optimism over SNT for development made him a, in fact a messiah for SNT based growth. A group of elite scientists identified with his vision. Uh, so, uh, Nehru's uh, one of the important features in the post independence period, right from the beginning, was that he developed a close alliance between science and politics. And this alliance he developed with a group of uh, a small group of people. Uh, he accepted the A.V. Hill model, supported by the, the, the close alliance between science and politics initiated by Nehru involved Homi Baba, S.S. Bhatnagar, J.C. Ghosh, uh, P, uh, P.C. Mahanlobis, D.S. Kotari and uh, some of those uh, people. So once we say that there is an alliance between science and politics, so there has to be people also outside the alliance. Obviously, some of the elite outside this alliance was M.N. Saha, C.V. Raman, J.C. Kumarappa, B.P. Paul, and there were a uh, few others uh, of the people. Uh, so it was a kind of a situation where there was a close alliance between science and politics, and people like M.N. Saha, who were very critical about the Nehruvian uh, post-independence uh, uh, science and technology organization, he was critical, but he supported Nehru on most of the uh, international relations in the science and technology. Rather, he became a member of a parliament, uh, uh, sitting in the parliament uh, in opposing, opposition to the Congress party because he contested as an independent from Calcutta constituency. So at independence, what we had is, what we have is a Trimurti in science uh, consisting of Homi Baba, who uh, inaugurated the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. S.S. Bhatnagar, who was known for uh, creating a, a chain of national laboratories. Rather, Ram, Raman uh, uh, commented the uh, Bhatnagar and Nehru effect for the a rapid expansion of the CSIR labs. And thirdly, Saha was the, the third Trimurti of the uh, science, who also inaugurated the Saha Institute of Physics in uh, uh, Calcutta. Uh, all these people played a very significant role in the organization of the science, and these were uh, some of the luminaries of the Indian science. Then if you look towards the growth of the science and technology organization in the post-independence period, uh, there were two policy perspectives of SNT policy perspectives, which were very, very important. Uh, the Nehru's vision... Uh, which was a kind of a very important, who was the main actor within these two policy perspectives. Uh, his vision about the science and technology, as I already mentioned, that uh, he believed in the modern science and technology and his unbound optimism 
uh, towards science and technology development was uh, a very important factor. He thought that uh, it was unbound optimism. Why, why I'm calling is that he thought that once you organize science and technology in the country uh, during those initial stages, uh, create an infrastructure and create some of the uh, leading universities, including the IITs, the development will flow over a period of time. So that was the kind of the uh, vision, uh, basically, which was there. And later on, it was put in the scientific policy resolution. His vision was also reflected a kind of a confluence between the Soviet socialistic planning and the Western industrial capitalism. So he was influenced by both these kind of a socialistic planning that most of the command sectors in India were placed under the, uh, the government. And at the same time, he left a, a kind of a sector for the industrial capitalism. Uh, so it was a kind of a mixture of these kind of a mixed economy, which were many uh, Indian economies call later on. Uh, no specific SNT policy was announced uh, as uh, during this period, uh, during the first one or two decades of their independence. Uh, the, the, much of the SNT policy was based on the science and politics alliance, uh, which played a dominant role in shaping the SNT development and the organization. In terms of the two policy perspective, the first policy was the policy for the science. A policy for the science was a perspective where, which was of the view that once the infrastructure in R&D is created, personal train and a set of institutions and universities established, most problems of s and development would be accomplished. This was also kind of one can see within the scientific policy resolution which was in fact a testament of faith in the science and a vision of society, which was in fact a kind of a product of Homi Baba and Nehru. Uh, all this uh, led to the kind of the growth of the infrastructure in SNT and the higher education institutions. Uh, many important institutions, I don't have to go into the details, Department of Atomic Energy, CSR, ICMR, I, uh, Agriculture Research Institute, DRDO, where DS Kotari was there, and the Space Research. Many of these organizations were created as a part of the policy for science in the post-independence period. And the alliance between science and politics meant growth of SNT in certain directions and focused in specific institutions. So that is the point I'm trying to make here. So when I say that the science and politics uh, really uh, a kind of an alliance shaped this whole the SNT growth in certain directions, uh, you can imagine that uh, uh, in, with very limited resources, since Baba was very much part of this alliance who wanted to develop atomic energy. So we placed so much uh, a focus on the atomic energy in the 1940s and the 50s, uh, while the uh, coal R&D utilization went into the whole background. Uh, even if you look in terms of the whole agriculture research, as B.P. Paul uh, a grand old agriculture scientist lamented later on in his uh, memoirs. He said that how much the application of science to agriculture might have advanced if Nehru had been directly associated with ICER in the way in which he was associated with CSR and DAE. So this is the kind of the uh, 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 narrative you will find at that particular point of time where the science and politics uh, a kind of uh, uh, arrangement uh, led to the growth of science and technology in certain directions and in certain sp uh, specific uh, institutions. Uh, B.P. Paul lamented and uh, uh, only in the 19, uh, late 60s and the 70s, uh, the, the much focus after Nehru uh, was given to the kind of uh, uh, whole agriculture research and which led to the uh, Green Revolution, which is a later on this thing. But the whole point is that the point I'm trying to make is that the science and politics nexus was very important as a part of the policy for science perspective, where the infrastructure and the growth of science and technology has taken place, but it has taken, but it has taken certain shape uh, in certain institutions. Similarly, MN Saha wanted to develop R&D base in universities. Uh, uh, basically, he wanted to uh, since uh, Baba, Homi Baba wanted to uh, uh, develop the uh, atomic energy uh, and rather the headquarters of atomic energy was taken to Mumbai, Bombay at that particular point of time. And MN Saha wanted to develop uh, research in the universities also. In, and in fact, rather than putting all eggs in the kind of one institution in terms of the whole atomic energy uh, establishment, he also wanted to develop nuclear uh, sciences in the universities. So he goes on to uh, 
uh, critique uh, uh, Bhatnagar. Bhatnagar was a very powerful uh, uh, person at that particular point of time, who was also secretary atomic energy. He was the chief of the CSR. He was also the UGC chairman uh, till 1954. So the first uh, UGC chairman who controlled a lot of uh, money, uh, he was uh, uh, also governing the universities. So the Saha's critique of uh, uh, Bhatnagar said that, I quote, the national laboratories which you have erected will not satisfy our needs. You have erected a temple, but you have not made any provision. Uh, that there should be constant influx of qualified vot votaries uh, into the temple, which will bring life into life. If you if you want to instill life into this country, and if you want to train band of workers for the great work of reconstruction, which has been the dream, I would appeal uh, I will uh, appeal to you to give up this policy of indifference, this policy of denial. You must gird up your alliance and find money so that we render sufficient assistance to universities and revitalize their activities. So this is the kind of uh, uh, a perspective we will find in terms of the policy for science perspective, where a certain critical comments by some of the elite scientists you will find. And uh, that is how that uh, much of the research was con concentrated in the public research institutions. and. Uh, universities were given only a marginal role. Uh, the second is the science for policy. There were notable achievements, but there was underbelly of the dark clouds also. Uh, the, so, so the second uh, SNT policy perspective at that particular point of time, uh, which was uh, which enveloped with the uh, policy for science. So the second one was the science for the policy perspective, which reflects a series of SNT developments which began to feed into the political expectations. That is, that once you develop the science and technology infrastructure and a set of institutions, they would be uh, sort of responding to the political expectations. So two, two decades of Nehruvian science and technology organization witnessed some uh, very good results. In fact, that uh, when we go, when we get into uh, 1970s and the 1980s, uh, you will come to Smiling Buddha, which is the first uh, nuclear explosion in 1974, uh, launching of the satellites Aryabhatta and Rohini. Again, uh, uh, the Soviet assistance was very important at that particular point of time. 1970s to 80s also witnessed the fourfold increase in the defense and the nuclear budgets uh, of India. But early 80s, India entered into the nuclear and the space clubs of the world, which was very important. In the 1990s, we have seen the poke round too. This was also the period when the Department of uh, Electronics and the uh, uh, Electronic Commission, uh, which were basically uh, also one can see as a spin-off from the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and the DAE, and the Software Center from the C, uh, TFR uh, came out. Uh, TFR was a very excellent model, uh, which was in fact the science uh, model. Uh, this period also in the 70s and the 80s witnessed the green and the white revolution, thanks to late uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri, former prime minister, and Dr. V. Kurian, that led to the sustained onslaught uh, of, from the European Union, which dumped the milk in India and, and the West uh, on the milk industry. And uh, there was a whole conflict between the European Union and the Indian milk industry at particular, that particular point of time. Dr. Kurian, uh, known as father of India's uh, white revolution, uh, who had good support from the prime minister, late Lal Bahadur Shastri, was able to sustain this onslaught and uh, was able to develop the whole milk industry, the Amul. India emerged as the largest producer of the milk in the world today. Uh, National Dairy Development Board came out as a part of the whole uh, crisis which went on at that particular point of time. In fact, a lot of the aid in terms of the milk powder which came, which was sold uh, by uh, Korean and uh, Amul. And uh, uh, the rents generated from that uh, went into the creation of the NDDB, uh, which was a very important institution. Uh, this, all, this period also saw the Indian Patent Act of 1971, uh, where CSR's four or five laboratories created a foundation for current progress in the pharmaceutical industry. There are four or five labs of CA, Indian CSIR, which worked on the uh, drug research and the chemicals. And the 1971 patent tax, which has a protect, protected patents only for the seven years. So after seven years, you could uh, kind of uh, do reverse engineering and put uh, 
uh, patents which are exhausted after seven years into the market. So that, that is how the whole technological capabilities through reverse engineering was created. Remember, uh, reverse engineering is not a simple uh, mechanism, only sophisticated uh, technological capabilities uh, if you have in chemical and the pharmaceutical research, only then you can sort of uh, put up this kind of a uh, 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 kind of the success and uh, which was initially came from the CSR labs. The mention may be also made in the 1950s of the CFTR as Amul formula, which replaced Glaxo by 1960s. Uh, then we have the CMARI's uh, innovation leading to the Surat tractor, which was the most successful in the Green Revolution area. With some good achievements in this phase, we also uh, come to the whole underbelly of the dark clouds. So fine for the policy, if you look back, uh, you will find there were many fantastic achievements and where uh, India was, uh, it was a kind of a, a takeoff in that particular point of time in the 80s because India entered into the space and the uh, uh, nuclear clubs. But at the same time, there were a number of un uh, underbelly of dark clouds. So we come to this uh, whole period uh, when they were the whole underbelly of the dark clouds and the whole optimism of Nehru, which was in a way shattered to a, a, a large extent. Now, entering 70s and the 80s, we also confront these dark clouds. We're beginning with the 1973 oil crisis. Then the, we all know that the AT movement, appropriate technology movement also came up. The rise of the environmental and the people science movement is uh, the period came up after 19, mid 70s and towards the late uh, 70s, uh, which questioned and critiqued the Nehruvian model. There was a whole consensus towards the failure of the trickle down theory. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, while there were many uh, kind of a success stories uh, of the Nehruvian uh, development in the post-independence uh, period for almost about uh, two decades, uh, where his whole optimism was that over a period of time when the science and technology institutions are created, there would be a kind of a development flows. In fact, he was uh, accepting this whole trickle-down theory, which uh, many people by the 1980s uh, uh, saw as the relative failure of the trickle-down theory. While the Green Revolution led to some successes, uh, in fact, it was a great success uh, from one point of view, because with a huge population, India was not dependent on the food grains to the outside countries. Imagine a country of 1 billion, more than 1 billion people being dependent on the, the food. So the Green Revolution, though it is uh, characterized as a Green Revolution, it had uh, many positive aspects uh, averting the uh, food dependence. It also rendered the marginalized farmers into laborers. So that was the kind of the critique which was coming from Vandana Shiva and most of the environmental movement people. Uh, 19, so given the kind of the crisis, there had to be a response. As I earlier mentioned that under the uh, science and uh, politics uh, alliance, uh, which was initiated by Nehru and a small group of elite scientists, there was no SNT plan. So the first SNT plan was, came, comes up in 1974 to 79, after some of the crisis uh, which I mentioned has uh, have cropped up. Uh, so the National uh, Council for Science and Technology at that particular uh, point of time of the DST came out with the 600 pages of the first SNT plan. And this is also the period when the emergence of the Janta government also meant a new le lease of life for the Gandhian uh, based developmental processes, which uh, lied very dormant and where only a very few institutions like KVIC and some of those institutions were created at the, that particular point of time. So with the Janta government coming into the power in the 19, between 1974 and 79, at that particular point of time, we will also find in Indian Institute of Science, uh, the Astra Group application of science and technology to rural areas was created by A.K. and Reddy and several Gandhian institutions, including Barefoot College, which came up at that particular point of time. Uh, this was also the period, as I mentioned, about the rise of the people science movement, where we had organizations like the KSSP, Kerala Shastra Sahitya Parishad, which had about 50,000 uh, uh, full-time workers, most of them teachers. We had uh, groups like Eklavya, there were some 20 organizations and the alternative science uh, groups are all, were also there, led by people. Uh, there were different type of uh, 
uh, uh, groups of people were there in the alternative science movement, uh, right from anti-science people uh, like Ashish Nandi to Claude Alvarez, Vandana Shiva, the Chipko movement, and the PPSP, the Narmada Bachao Andolan. So we had uh, two uh, different kind of the groups uh, which came up as a part of the science movement in the 1970s and the 1980s. 1980s also witnessed the Bhopal gas tragedy and exposed how India's SNT organization neglected the technological risks and technology assessment. So that's what I mean, that uh, while there was a number of success stories in terms of the uh, science and technology uh, uh, policy for science and technology uh, in the two decades, there was also underbelly of the dark clouds and some of the optimism which was initially, which was there during the Nehruvian era, got uh, somewhat uh, uh, shattered. So in the 1980s, when you come down, you have a, a technology policy in the midst of a tragedy. Uh, 1974 plan was a response to the increasing neglect of developmental issues. Uh, basically, the plan said that the priorities to be determined with declared priorities of the developmental plans of the five-year plans. So the, for the first time, something like a science and technology planning was there. Uh, to identify areas for technological improvement, subserving the socio-economic goals set by the planning commission. I said that uh, the kind of the Gandhian, uh, this thing was uh, coming up in terms of the whole rural development and the socio-economic goals, since there were a lot of problems of the trickle, failure of the trickle-down theories and the problems of development. They were talking in terms of the whole uh, uh, socio-economic goals. So in a decade in 1983, another technology policy followed with a focus on the technology assessment and a focus on the new technologies. 1980s again witnessed uh, uh, the, uh, when again the Congress government came and uh, Sam Petroda enters into the whole scene. Then a kind of a new institutions, uh, kind of a telecommunications and the uh, DBT, uh, the Biotechnology Center for the Development of Advanced Computing, the CMC, and many of the organizations were established at that particular point of time. So the kind of the point which was important at this particular point of time with the kind of the crisis and with the kind of the uh, science movements which were questioning uh, the government, uh, the government response was in terms of a whole technological determinism. Technological determinism basically means that uh, uh, you, uh, you name a socio-economic problem so we can have a technological fix. So that was the kind of the technological determinism uh, perspective which you will find from the uh, government uh, uh, where people like Sam Petroda and several others were uh, very important. Uh, so technological determinism at the cost of social shaping of technology uh, was adopted, one could see from uh, many of the policies. Uh, and this, this was also the period that uh, 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 when uh, technology missions uh, came up uh, for very they identified number of socioeconomic problems in terms of humanization, oil seeds, drinking water, literacy, and telecommunication. So said if you, you take out a, a kind of a social and economic problem uh, involving science and technology, we can have a technological fix. So that was the kind of a response uh, uh, in terms of the whole technological uh, technology missions. So I'm not saying that they all had dysfunctional uh, 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 impact on the society, but that was the kind of the uh, kind of the science and uh, technology policy perspective you can find in terms of the whole thing. Uh, so the Nehruvian era of science and political alliance gave way to institutionalized science and technology policies. So it was for the first time that uh, you will find that science and technology planning uh, coming up. Uh, then you had the 1983 technology policy statement. The whole charisma of Nehru. Uh, which was there as the science and politics alliance, uh, gave way to a kind of institutionalization. Sociologically speaking, what happens is that when there is a charisma over a period of time, that charisma has to get routinized. And this routinization of the charisma takes place in terms of institutionalization, wherever uh, uh, some of those uh, important uh, actors and the roles they played. So that is what happened in terms of the after 19 mid 70s, where after the science and technology plan and when the 1983 uh, technology policy statement came up. Uh, if, so many of the planning on science and technology and the science policy got more institutionalized. Uh, as uh, Dinesh Sharma, one of the science journalists, uh, uh, 
uh, recalls, I quote him, if Nehru was the political patron of Indian science, Rajiv was the political patron of Indian technology. In the Nehru era, science developed through pol politician scientist alliances. In the Rajiv era, technology developed through politician technocratic alliances. So this is what Dinesh Sharma says. So as we approach 1990, India entered into a new phase of globalization coupled with uh, economic uh, uh, reforms. So uh, after the, uh, the kind of the uh, earlier phase, then we enter into the 1990, 1991, uh, as uh, uh, many of us know, it was the era of new economic reforms uh, where the globalization uh, uh, becomes uh, very important. And here globalization impacting the science and technology institutions led to what is known as a new social contract of science. If you look in terms of the whole uh, vision of the science and the central tenets of the science and technology at that particular point of time, the 1990s, in terms of the whole globalization. Uh, on the left hand, you will find the existing social contract. On the right hand, you will find the emerging social contract. So, for instance, science was always a part of a culture. Uh, from science as a part of a culture, it is started uh, becoming part of the commerce and the market in terms of the whole globalization impacting the science and technology institution. So this was the kind of the uh, uh, global development where India was not uh, 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 excluded from that. And India was very much part of this globalization process. So advancing knowledge, which was one of the most important aspects of the science, generating wealth and uh, profits was also become more important. If you see some of the uh, uh, a kind of the statements from people like Mashelkar, uh, who, who said, I'm the CEO of CS, CSIR uh, in the, uh, during his regime, uh, you will uh, appreciate some of these uh, kind of this thing. Open science, uh, uh, one of the important aspects of the uh, science was that uh, science should be open and advancement of science is very important. It led to the whole intellectual property rights and secrecy was accepted. Uh, by much of the scientific community. Uh, the, from the peer evaluation, which was done basically from the science as social institution by the scientific community, they were regulated, stake, they were, science was regulated by stakeholders outside the science system. Uh, from academic science in the universities, uh, there was a whole new understanding of the entrepreneurial universities and uh, uh, the public good from the science as public good conducive for advancement of knowledge. They have accepted that the science as the market good and IPR and institutionalization uh, was seen uh, uh, aborting, which aborts the knowledge which was accepted in terms of the whole thing. So what you will find is that there was this in this whole period of the 1990s, there's a whole impact of the globalization, which is, I, I will not get into further uh, details in the, uh, in the whole uh, period. So uh, the reforms and the transition towards the innovation policies. Earlier, uh, we talked about the uh, technology policy. Uh, so the new contract manifested in varying forms and different institutions. I will not go into many of the details. I just gave an example of how Mashelkar uh, accepted these kind of the values and it was accepted in many of the uh, the policy documents at that particular point of time you go that uh, it was important for uh, science as institution to develop the kind of uh, intellectual property uh, Marshall Curry even said that the you publish and uh, you patent and perish you know something like that not only do publish and perish but you also uh, a patent and flourish uh, so the new contract manifested in varying forms and different institutions. Overall, if you see from the 70s to the 90s that the from 4.4 uh, uh, economic growth in the 70s and the 80s accelerated to 5.5% in the 1990s. And with the kind of the new economic reforms, it further progressed between 7.1 to 8% during the next 15 years. It was one of the best periods, in fact, uh, after the Manmohan Singh uh, government came into the uh, whole being after the uh, uh, new economic reforms. Uh, we will also witness the growth in the uh, information communication, the software sector, the auto sector, the biotechnology, the pharma, aerospace, and other dynamic sector led to thinkers to think about the rise of India with China uh, theme during the 1990s and the 2005. So people were talking about the rise of India and China at that particular point of time uh, with the kind of the uh, uh, economic growth uh, 
uh, with much of it which was contributed with the with the kind of the uh, technology and the uh, ICT software and many of the sectors which was there at that particular point of time. Uh, even Jairam Ramesh in 2005, who was the minister, coined the term Chindia uh, for uh, China and India. Unfortunately, in 2022, nobody talks about Chindia. It is only China, rise of China we talk about. Uh, but in any case, it was a period when they talked about the rise of India and China and Chindia and wrote a foreword for Jagdish Seth book on the Chindia rising. Uh, this was also the period when the 400 global tech firms opened up R&D centers in India, and many of them are in the Bangalore, uh, uh, Hyderabad, and uh, many of those regions. Uh, they came as a part of the whole globalization process. So the SNT-led economic growth enabled India to lift 90 million out of the poverty during 2011 and 2016, which was an important uh, social uh, economic uh, aspects of the SNT policies and the uh, uh, emerging innovation policy at that particular point of time, which was the kind of the critique of uh, uh, the technology missions at that particular point of time. Uh, India also transitioned to innovation policies that demonstrated in the 2013 Science and Technology Innovation Policy doc, uh, uh, policy uh, NNC, uh, inaugurated by the Indian government at that particular point of time. As many of you also remember, President of India declared a decade of innovation from in 2010. So innovation policies for the first time was given prominence within the science and uh, technology policy so, of the government of India. Somehow India could not take off uh, through science and technology that growth and innovation, despite uh, many of the rise of India discourse and the rise of Chindia discourse. As Nathan Rosenberg, who is one of the uh, leading scholars in the science and innovation policy reminds us that India represents what appears to be a case of low payoffs from a relatively well-developed and extensive scientific and technological infrastructure. Of course, he made in somewhere in the late 90s this statement, but which still holds good uh, in terms of if you compare India with China in terms of the whole thing. Basically, he said that uh, India represents a very uh, uh, good high development of the science and technology, but uh, low payoffs from a relatively well developed. There were a number of problems, including SNT policies. We often compare with South Korea, East Asia, and now China, but India failed to emulate and institutionalize rela relevant innovation policies uh, besides low levels of national R&D investments. This is more of the last uh, one and a half decades or two decades uh, uh, kind of a uh, uh, statements I'm making. There were a number of very good innovation policy measures and in the instruments, but uh, they operated at a subcritical level. For example, if you take, there were 100% or 150% tax exemption which were given to the private firms, but these uh, uh, tax exemptions, they did not have any underpinning uh, of the penal laws. When they, but when you compare with the South Korea, uh, South Korea at the same time in the 90s and uh, after 2000 uh, uh, initiated something like 18 SNT laws. So, uh, for instance, if you compare India and uh, South Korea in terms of how uh, tax exemption laws operate, in South Korea, if a private company takes 150% tax exemption, if the money they don't invest into the R&D, the company goes out of business. You know, so there was a penal underpinning to the kind of the whole uh, tax clause, but there was nothing of that sort of the uh, penal underpinning to the SNT laws or the SNT policy measures, which was there uh, from the uh, Indian government's Department of Science and Technology Policy. That is one particular uh, thing I'm saying. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that we were emulating the kind of the policies from others, but we were not able to completely institutionalize and implement those policy measures. Uh, secondly, you can take the example of the Technology Development Board, which played a very dominant and very important role in terms of the whole technological capabilities, rather in fact, the hepatitis, vaccine, and even the kind of the nano uh, car. And there were a number of schemes which were funded from the Technology Development Board. But if you really look into the kind of, uh, there were other three or four innovation schemes of the Department of the Science and Technology and the DSIR. Uh, now, if you specifically take the Technology Development Board, India collects assets from the industry. Uh, it runs into 
uh, uh, millions and millions of uh, dollars. But only a small proportion, about 10 or 15 percent, goes to the Technology Development Board, where much of this says is supposed to go completely to the Department of Science and Technology uh, department for the development of the technology, for developing the technological capabilities of that particular industry from where the CES is collected. But if you see only 10 to 15 or even 20 percent, unfortunately, very little research has gone into that. How much of the money collected into the CES really go into the technology development uh, board? Uh, but from the reli from reliable sources, uh, which we have seen, that hardly 15 uh, to 20 percent of the money collected under the industry says goes into the technology development board and the government uses it uh, for some other purposes and there is no critique on this particular policy measure so what i'm trying to basically say is that we were very very good uh, innovation policies were enunciated uh, from the government but in terms of the institutionalization in terms of the implementation they had a very bad uh, mark uh, so we also, when we look into the last uh, decade and a half, we also land up in a uh, situation where uh, we have a number of islands of excellence, but vast interlands of underdevelopment. Uh, what I mean by this, I will give you some examples. You take the case of the universities. Now, higher education sector, even though 65% of the total science output it is given by the scientometrics data from uh, people like uh, Arunachalam and uh, uh, Gangan Pratap and others. Uh, uh, a lot of scientometric data is there. Uh, from last two or two and a half decades, if you see that the higher education institutional sector contributes 65 percent of the total science output measured through Scopus or SCI, whatever you do, uh, which is accounted by the universities but they are hardly allocated about 5 to 6% of the gross expenditure on the research and development. So 95% of the public research is money, uh, GERD goes to public research institutions and the business enterprises. So what happens is that the R&D and s &T investment, particularly universities, have drastically aborted their ability to compete at the international level in the for developing world-class university ranking. Not a single Indian university today is in the top 100, you see. Uh, what is known, what has come to be known as the Humboldtian goal, which basically means that the government supports uh, uh, research intensive within the universities, uh, and this research intensity, teaching and the research intensity is very important for the university and it should be funded from the government. So that is the Humboldtian goal, which remains to be accomplished. Only 10 to 15 percent of the universities in India, you can uh, term it as teaching and the research universities. The rest, almost about 85 percent, about 800 universities are just teaching universities. Uh, not the new education policy 2021 did not provide any roadmap how to achieve the Humboldtian goal and how to increase the kind of the research intensity in terms of the whole universities. Uh, Government of India initiated a policy for the establishment of the National Research Foundation, which is a very good step. But its location and the level of funding poses several questions. You know, very little funding has gone into it. Uh, so the universities is the is the one where you will find the vast interlands of underdevelopment. The second interland, vast interland of underdevelopment is the SME clusters. Uh, basically, the science and technology and the innovation policies have given very little focus on the SME clusters. There are more than 650 major industrial clusters which are reeling uh, with traditional and the outdated technology. If you if you look in Muradabad, the the whole dyeing and the casting technology is the 50 years old, uh, very low technological capabilities, unable to compete in the globalized era. So uh, there are a number of examples of Meerut, Aligarh, Muradabad, and uh, uh, no policy documents have given a real roadmap in terms of the whole rejuvenation of these. Uh, if you look in Aligarh, 120 firms are there, which produces locks we each one of us use at some particular point of time. And 10% of the firms in Aligarh are closing down every year. Uh, uh, the Moradabad, which is the brassware, which works with the uh, 
a 50 years old uh, dyeing and the casting technology and the merit you will find the printing and the sports good industry but not a single journalism uh, uh, course you will find not a, a single uh, training programs in terms of the whole sports good which you will find in the merit where there are more than 35 colleges so uh, so what basically i am trying to say is that the whole sme clusters uh, which are there uh, which still uh, survive in terms of the whole cheap labor and the natural resource endowments. Uh, but that particular paradigm is uh, gone, is gone, uh, is, has gone and vanishing with the whole globalization. Uh, I will again come uh, back to that. Then the third is the large informal sector you have. Uh, more than 600 million people work in the informal sector. 90% of them between 18 to 35 years of age are age class drop-offs. Imagine 90% of the labor force, of the total labor force uh, 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 are eighth class dropouts and uh, they are in the informal sector. Uh, we often, uh, our policy thinkers have often talked about demographic dividend. Uh, demographic dividend is already leading us to relative demographic disaster after the pandemic. Uh, SMEs in the informal sector remain outside the uh, science, technology and the innovation policies. Uh, this is a very big challenge in terms of educational and the skill innovation. There is a skill development ministry, but imparting skills to this segment of population is going at a very low uh, space, uh, which is uh, uh, a kind of which is going to create a another uh, big crisis in the post uh, pandemic era. More than dozen relatively successful inclusive innovation models such as Barefoot College, Honeybee Network, Seva, Jaipur Food, Arvind I Care. Now, these are the very successful models which are based on the Gandhian models. Unfortunately, uh, uh, they were not scaled up for a number of reasons. SME policies thus far have failed to focus on these important Gandhian-based development models. Uh, so the point here I'm trying to make is there is a need for reinvention of the Gandhian models of development in the era of globalization, specifically because there are more than 600 to 700 million people who are in the informal sector, who are very poor and who are young. And these people have to be skilled. And even I, ITIs will not be very much useful to them because uh, uh, ITIs demand at least class 10 or the class uh, uh, 12 uh, metric certificate. And 90% uh, of the informal sector workers are eighth class dropout. So this is where I say that, that there are a number of highlands of excellence. We have uh, Indian Institute of Science, we have JNU, and we have... Uh, Delhi University, 30 uh, top class universities we have in India, uh, we have TFR and we have a number of uh, various institutions. I don't have to go into detail, but there are vast uh, interlands of uh, uh, interlands of underdevelopment, uh, which STIP policies have not uh, focused much. So if you uh, then we come down to science and technology innovation policies for development in the last uh, one and a half decade. And there, here, what we see is that for one step forward we are making, we are also making two steps backwards. What I mean by this is that in the last decade and few years, STIP for development witnessed some promising national flagship projects. Uh, you can take Aadhaar, Digital India, very fantastic uh, program. Uh, no other developing country has... Uh, uh, had this kind of a, uh, a policy, a flagship program in terms of the whole Aadhaar and the digital. Uh, the, uh, the, the, in terms of the whole policy prescription, uh, we came out that there would be 100 smart cities. Uh, there was a mission for the Clean Ganga, which was a fantastic project, the whole waste management, uh, Make in India, the startup, uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, which we also call. Uh, but but the roots of that goes back to the self-reliance of the 1970s and the 80s. Uh, you take one uh, kind of the flagship program, 100 smart cities, we said. But do we, we have to ask a question very seriously that do we have one model smart city uh, in the country today? If that smart city is there, which is that smart city where we can scale up? So, uh, uh, so there are issues, uh, some of those. We did experience some relative success in digital India where we have more than 1.2 billion people have these uh, 
mobile phones but here again very low payoffs and at time dismal performance from the science and technology innovation policy perspective we take the case of the fourth industrial revolution technologies uh, we have a uh, number of policy documents on the artificial intelligence robotics 5g telecommunications quantum frontier in technologies uh, the psc and the dst has come out with number of uh, uh, even the uh, 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 these institutions have come out with number of the policy documents on electric vehicles uh, quantum frontier technologies 5g telecommunications biosciences for the health very uh, robust in terms of the policy discourse and the expert reports are there uh, from niti ayog to uh, principal scientific advisory office you will find uh, science and technology innovation policy demonstrates structural and institutional gaps between theory and practice and the management of r&d systems uh, so this is the point i am trying to make not adequate budget allocations to these flagship projects in 2021 and 2122 there is no rad- road map in the stip draft report which is there in the public domain uh, if there is i would one would like to see that what is the road map for development having already uh developed fantastic reports by niti ayog and the psc and the dst on artificial intelligence electric vehicles and the quantum frontier technologies what is the road map in terms of the whole money and the institutional uh, structure uh, where uh, these te- emerging technologies will be promoted in the coming 5 to 10 years and we have to definitely benchmark with china in terms of many of these uh, frontier technologies the existing structure and organization of the science and technology innovation policy for development brings us to this question of its link with the concept of the national innovation system so when you look into so this whole problem in terms of where uh, uh, there are uh, problems in terms of the whole science and technology innovation policies uh they will bring us to the whole concept of the national innovation system uh, and the stip uh so one would like to ask a question to what extent stip in the last decade and a half established a national innovation system in the country as you all know and many of the young scholars who uh, very dynamic young scholars in this research center uh, know about the national innovation system uh, but to remind uh, also the other audience who are listening to this lecture Uh, uh christopher freeman talked about the national innovation system as the network of institutions in the public and the private sectors whose activities and interactions in- initiate import modify and diffuse new technologies uh, metcalf on the other hand said that that's uh, nis nis means basically that set of distinct institutions which jointly and individually contribute to the development and diffusion of new technologies which provide the framework within which government form and implement policies to influence the innovation process it is a system of interconnected institutions to create store and transfer knowledge skills artifacts with defined new technologies close this is what metcalf said so we need to sincerely understand the concept of national innovation system and the your dst center definitely is trying to do this and i am sure that the money of the young scholars are looking into Uh, the whole understanding of the whole concept of the national innovation system and its links with the science and technology innovation policy in, in the indian context and critically analyze how stip links up and has a bearing on it uh, one of the major problems of stip in india is that our efforts have fallen short to organize and institutionalize a strong national innovation system including regional and rural innovation uh, systems the national innovation system is there similarly we have the regional and the rural innovation system which is very very important so the point i'm trying to make is that that our efforts so far have fallen short to organize and institutionalize a strong uh, national innovation system if you ask why why this has happened there are problems at many fronts but towards the closing of my talk i would propose and mention five or six issues so some of the issues of the stip and the nis which is the kind of the concluding part of my uh, lecture the first problem is the rnd gdp which is a major problem what i mean by is the gross expenditure on the research and development as a proportion of the gdp remained relatively stagnant and in fact receded 
from 0.8% of GDP in 1990s to 0.7% in 2020. Gulf between theory and practice of science policy, you can easily see it here. The successive governments, including Manmohan Singh and including the present prime minister, went to the Science Congress every year in January and committed 2% of India's GDP uh, for the research and development for the uh, science and technology uh, since 2000, you know, almost for about two more than two decades. Uh, they committed 2% of the GDP, which remains a very big dream in 2022. So this is one of the major problems uh, for most of the issues I mentioned in the past that uh, we are operating at a subcritical level with, uh, uh, with frontier technologies and with uh, uh, a very huge uh, uh, policy documents, which is very laudable uh, SNT policy documents. This low investment is responsible for India's weak uh, national innovation system in, two, in 2022. We are unable to adequately invest in our flagship programs like smart cities, digital India, clean India, etc., etc. These are fantastic flagship programs and uh, the government is to be con uh, congratulated. But at the same time, one has to ask that why money, sufficient money has not been allocated uh, in terms of the whole R&D implications of these programs. So dismal investments have gone into these projects. India will not be able to develop national technological capacities in new technologies such as artificial intelligence, robotics, IoT, electronics, and 5G this, with this level of 0.8% of GDP uh, uh, for the R&D. So this is the first problem uh, of the issues between SPIP and the NIS. Uh, the second problem is a need for a paradigm shift in the STIP. Uh, I, I carefully listened to the lecture by Dr. Arvinda Mitra uh, given at the DST Center. And he also made this point that we need a paradigm shift in the STIP, uh, which is the second point I make in terms of my own uh, 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 summarizing uh, issues. STIP need to transform from a vertical centralization to horizontal structural linkages uh, here we are serious if we are serious about implementing a national innovation system of governance so this has to go from vertical centralization to a horizontal structural linkages the scientific advice from the dst relevant government ministries including the pac the government uh, ministries from finance commerce industry to the industry uh, business enterprises, society linkages need to be forced as they're relatively absent now. Uh, because if you look in each and every policy, uh, whether it is artificial intelligence, whether it is on uh, uh, innovation, whether it is on uh, small technologies, there's all, all uh, types of uh, actors, all types of institutions, uh, both government and the societal uh, agents are involved in it. And every uh, each member of uh, this system need to be uh, networked and we need a, a new approach of STIP for policy to address crisis, example pandemic and large migration in formal sectors is a kind of a thing. Policy and government need to get integrated with society and the people. This is what also Dr. Mitra mentioned in, the, uh, in this lecture. Uh, he also said the SNT has to be embedded with various arms of the government in ministries and agencies. We need to link them up. Uh, I completely agree with uh, them. And this is my the second point. Thirdly, uh, STIP and the FDI in R&D. We have about 300 global firms in with R&D centers. But what is but what is the spillover impact of these R&D centers? Uh, what is the link with the startups? You see? Uh, good to learn that there is some movement in this direction, but I think more research is needed to see that how we are able to uh, take benefit from these 300 global Fortune 500 firms who are operating their R&D centers in this country. We need a good study on them and we need to, uh, 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 I'm sure there are one or two studies, but I don't know to what extent they are uh, followed up by in terms of the whole policy in this thing. The fourth one is the STIP and the university industry relations, uh, triple helix. Universities could become new frontiers of innovation. We need to build SNT parks and look into exemplary cases in Taiwan, China, and Singapore. Because if you look in Taiwan, 
uh, it is the university industry relations of the Sinchu Science Park and the two universities from the 1990s led to the uh, led to Taiwan as the global leader in the semiconductor industry. The same thing went on in China in terms of the Xinhua and the Peking universities in terms of the software sector. Uh, uh, there are a number of examples in the Singapore, why Singapore biopolis and the bio, uh, biomedical research has uh, advanced because of the science park. We could learn from new innovation landscapes involving universities and R&D institutions in these cities. I'm talking about universities particularly because uh, from the last four or five years, I myself was involved in the uh, kind of the university research. Uh, now, two, 2015, I did a report for the higher education report produced by uh, NUPA. Uh, uh, in 2018, I did uh, uh, universities and the national innovation systems, which is again experience from the Asia Pacific 13 country case studies. Uh, in 2022, uh, this year, uh, uh, my another book with the four Chinese scholars came up on the Chinese universities in the national innovation system. Uh, if the center uh, likes me to give a, a larger lecture on the universities and the research, I'm, I, I would be very delighted to uh, do that. So the fourth point I'm basically trying to make is the STIP and the university industry, triple helix. The universities could become a new frontier of the innovation and we need to build the SNT parks and uh, look into exemplary cases in Taiwan, China and Singapore. Uh, at present, only IIT Madras has a science park and uh, uh, there are ICT software technology parks are there. But we need to build at least uh, more than half a dozen uh, technology and innovation parks like the way at the Oxford University and the St. John's Innovation Park at the Cambridge University in our leading universities which are linked to the universities. Uh, the fifth point I would like to make is the STIP and the rural innovation system. There is a need to build the rural technological cap capabilities at the district level to cater to the needs and demands of the SMEs and the industrial uh, industrial clusters. I mentioned about uh, uh, Meerut, uh, Aligarh and uh, Muradabad, but there are more than 600 industrial clusters and the SMEs related to it. And 20% of India's GDP comes from these uh, sectors. The regional universities and agencies like CSR could be linked up along with the inclusive innovation institutions. This is important in the globalized era, in the present era, because basically if you see that the uh, uh, traditionally the natural resource endowments and the cheap labor uh, have given an uh, advantage to many of these industrial clusters which are operating with 20, 30, 40 years old technology. But with the globalization, it is a value addition of technology and the innovation which is only going to play a key role. So if, the, uh, if these... Uh, 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 industrial uh, sector and the SMEs are not linked up to the knowledge institutions, uh, then there will very little uh, dynamism could come about. So that is the kind of the point I'm trying to make. Uh, the sixth is India need to systematically benchmark with China in science and technology innovation policy issues. Why I'm saying that is the India and China as uh, uh, early as 19, early 90s were at almost at the same level. In 1993, India was producing 10,000 papers per uh, year and China was producing hardly 6,000 papers. But in the 21st century, now if you see, you can see where China has progressed and where India has lagged behind. This is basically because China today, which has five times the Indian uh, uh, economy, uh, is investing 2.2% of their GDP in the science and technology. Uh, the other important point is that in the 21st century, much of our efforts in nation building and occupying a key position on high table in the world, the, in the United Nations Agency, depends on growing economic power and the strong national innovation system. So in the last decade and a half, there are clear signs to suggest that India is missing the bus and how can we catch up? So this is the kind of a research agenda uh, we have to sort of chalk out. And the centers and some of the leading scholars in the center would take up many of the issues. Uh, and in this lecture, towards conclusion, I should also mention that I was not able to cover many of the points uh, which are there, including the gender uh, issues, the gender science and technology, 
some of uh, colleagues have produced a fantastic report from the UNESCO very recently. So some of those issues could not be taken up. So in one lecture, one cannot uh, cover many of them. So with these comments, I will close my uh, talk here and open up for discussion and questions. And thank you for your uh, patience. Uh, I will continue to be available on uh, email for any kind of questions. And even after this uh, kind of question and answer, uh, uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Krishna. That was an excellent talk. And uh, thank you for walking us through the entire post-independence Indian history and giving us the landscape and bringing forth some very pertinent issues with the current STI ecosystem. So for the questions, I'm sure a lot of people, these are of like a lot of interest to our fellows and our guests. Uh, so please use the uh, raise hand uh, icon on the panel and alternatively you can also type your questions and I can read it out for you. So for the first question I would invite Dr. Janice. Uh, Janice can you please turn on your video and audio and ask a question. Uh, thank you Pragya. Sorry I'm not able to turn on the video due to low bandwidth uh, but uh, thank you so much uh, Professor Krishna for that fantastic talk. I think you perfectly yeah. summarized uh, the journey of uh, Indian STI ecosystem with that uh, line which said that we have, uh, you know, islands of development and vast hinterlands of underdevelopment. And I believe uh, one of the reasons for this is also the diversity of India, which was not taken into consideration uh, due to, you know, that tendency of generalization. Do you think that the way forward is more about democratizing science policy uh, so that uh, these rural innovation systems are also taken into consideration. Uh, the reason I'm asking this is one of the areas that we were working on is uh, participatory science advice for policy making. And I believe having representation from uh, you know, these uh, rural backgrounds and uh, tier two, tier three cities is also essential so that mm -hmm. uh, the, the science policy largely caters to the needs of the real India, like we call it the two Indias. Uh, do you think uh, this democratization is possible and uh, if that's the way forward uh, for science policy in India? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, that's, uh, I would also uh, further add that uh, what basically I say there are a number of problems. If you take uh, one of the interlands, say Muradabad or uh, Meerut or Aligarh, uh, what is the problem? You see, you take, uh, uh, say, uh, Aligarh. Uh, we produce locks, you know, there are manual locks, uh, there are 120 firms are there. Every year you will find that 5 to 10 percent of the firms are closing down because of globalization, because of uh, information locks they are putting. And uh, there's a whole lot of globalization uh, that the Chinese imports of the locks are there. Uh, and they're not able to do. So what I'm basically trying to say is that the knowledge institutions will have to be linked up to the needs and demands of these sectors, you see, uh, but which I call in a way the rural innovation system. Take for example the, the Aligarh. Now suppose if Aligarh University's electronics department and engineering department is nothing to do with this, uh, uh, with the neighborhood Aligarh cluster, then you know what, what, what can you ask? And, and there are no uh, mechanisms in terms of linking them up you know so how do you establish so the small uh, firms uh, will not have the kind of the money to develop r d and the where uh, other kind of so if you have to develop technological capabilities at the district level uh, the policies will have to look into that how rural innovation system could be linked up with uh, investments and with also developing the district level technological capabilities to cater to these kinds of the needs and demands of these uh, industrial sectors and the SMEs. That, that, that is one level, you see. The second level is the kind of also skill and uh, training programs. You know, how do you, many of the people who work in such clusters, you know, there are informal sector workers, you know, and uh, who are, uh, 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 you know, in India, what we call by uh, Guru Shishya Parampara, you know, the uh, Chela uh, Guru uh, uh, training programs, you know, they, are, they go as a Chela and they learn learning by doing and stuff like that. But you need, you know, many of these people in the informal sector are the eighth class dropout, 90% of them. So you need skill programs for them. The second one is the skill program. So what you are definitely right, we need to 
democratization of the science and innovation in terms of these policies. I think I would stop there. And if you have further questions, you can write to me. I will uh, keep answering and we can communicate in terms of the whole uh, uh, email. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Yeah. Uh, Professor Krishna, you can unshare your screen if you want to. Uh, uh, also. OK. Uh, yeah. Stop sharing. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, next I would like to invite Dr. Suresh uh, Nandev. Suresh, can you please turn on your audio and ask a question? Thanks a lot, Prakya. And thank you uh, very much, Professor Krishna, for this uh, truly amazing uh, lecture and touching upon so many like uh, historical background in the current challenges that we have with uh, STEP in India. So uh, as you mentioned, uh, due to various historical leg legacies, uh, we have this uh, huge network of uh, labs of uh, CSIR, DRDO, ICAR, ICMR, and so on. And many of them uh, sadly have been uh, not as productive as one would have hoped for, right? So how do you think going forward, uh, you know, some th what steps can be taken from the policy angle to fix, fix this institutional structure that is already in place, make them more productive, more responsible, more responsive to the current and the future need of the country, how we can maybe connect them better to the university. And uh, uh, also, do you think it would be a good idea to convert some of them to research university rather than being just uh, national labs as they are right now? Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> You see, the, again, my first important point is that uh, you look into the CSR, where I have some, uh, I, I myself worked in CSR almost for more than two decades in the uh, 70s and the 80s, you know, before uh, going to JNU. Uh, uh, CSR, the first important, now if you look the whole budget structure of CSIR, if you really look into it, more than 80, 85 percent of the money is going in terms of maintenance, you know, salaries. So how much money is there left for the uh, research, uh, this thing? And if you see in the last decade that what is the kind of the increase of uh, CSIR uh, in terms of the whole uh, budget allocation, that is one issue, you know, which is the, where investment, that's what I said that one of my first points in terms of the whole why we are not able to establish a national innovation system is a very low 0.7% of our uh, GDP going into the kind of the R&D. And 70% of that money is going to three strategic sectors, atomic energy, space and defense. So what is left for 30% of the GERD of that 0.7% is a shoestring budget for a whole lot of uh, R&D organizations, you know. So, so the first fundamental point I'm trying to make is that from last two and a half decades that we have failed to increase this money. In absolute terms, definitely they have increased. But in terms of the keeping up with the needs and demands and with the kind of the GDP ratios, which you need at least one and a half to two percent or uh, two and a half percent. Now the South Korea does four percent. So that is the one important point. The second important point is there is uh, rather than converting into rather universities, you already have more than a thousand universities in India, you know. So even now uh, uh, the CSIR has an academic kind of the position. The whole problem is that say the CSR need to be linked up with the kind of the mission mandate. You see, the mission programs are very successful in space. The mission program is very successful in defense. The mission programs are very successful in uh, uh, atomic energy. So why mission programs are not successful in uh, CSR? You have to ask that question, first of all. So you give them a mission, they will accomplish it. They have accomplished in uh, Amul, uh, putting up... Uh, uh, replacing Glaxo by the 1960s, CFTRI has done it. In the Green Revolution, they have done with the Swarat tractor. So I don't find any reason why they can't uh, uh, do it now also. So if, if, if the policy goals are very clear with adequate funding, if the missions are given that these are the three or four missions you have to accomplish in this particular point of time, you will they will do it. So the second problem is the whole management and the goal direction which has to be linked up with the kind of the money. So that is the major problem which I look into it, you know. So uh, uh, even if you uh, see uh, CSR already has those, uh, that uh, uh, rural link up, 
you see for instance you take ceramics you have the ceramic uh, experimental station it had uh, it had it, it had more than 20 experimental stations uh, uh, kind of rural extension centers in the 1980s most of the iits have adopted uh, uh, villages where that uh, dynamism has gone csr has adopted a village you know uh, at that particular point of time at uh, uh, when we when i came to uh, 70s in csir in the 80s they have all adopted a village karimnagar village was the kind of the the thing in uh, csir so there is there is already such models and some experiences are there we need to revive these ones with additional funding and with the kind of the mission mode you see that mission mode is not there so that is the reason why i find the missions are so successful in uh, those three organizations and uh, we were able to uh, go from uh, you take the space we were able to go uh, put up uh, pslv platforms we were able to put up uh, gslv platforms and 80% of those platforms are atmanirbhar you see they are uh, endogenous and more than the, the 250 firms are working with isro today you see so you know give a mission they will accomplish it but the goals and the mission has to be very very clear Thank you very much, Professor Krishna. Okay. Now I would like to invite Dr. Radhika. Radhika, can you please turn on your audio and ask a question? Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Krishna. It was a wonderful talk and such a meaningful points were raised. Uh, so one of the slide that focused on what is our present social economic con con uh, concept going on that we promoted open science and know-how and then we started moving towards more of the IP driven economic growth for the country. So at present what we see that international organizations are promoting open science movement and simultaneously we are also promoting like IP is one of the key domain that we all are working and it's a very important part who whosoever is doing R&D in the country. So how, in your opinion, we can crack a balance between this open science and IPR generation in the country, the national IP regime, um, in the, specifically in the Indian context? Uh, that is my first question. And second, uh, just a comment on one of the important issues that you have raised around R&D investment, like low GRD in the country. Like we see there are a number of uh, R&D institutes in the country, number of universities are working for R&D. We have good number of NGOs also working in this field along with the other private sector holders. Do you think so collection of a data is also one of the major problem that we are not able to collect the data as for how much of an R&D investment actually goes in the country? Uh, are we reaching out to the universities like once we saw that what NAC says? Uh, they are very diluted parameters that are going to be linked with R&D. And similarly, how we are collecting information regarding R&D investment made from the informal sector. In fact, from the private sector also, it's very diluted. So how you, you like what recommendation you give, how we can link this problem with the solution for the GRD of the country. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, yeah. Okay, Radhika, it was nice uh, uh, seeing you again. Uh, well, uh, the whole open science and the intellectual property rights is the thing which has come out in the post, uh, uh, the globalized uh, era of science. Uh, in the globalization, uh, in the globalized era, what has happened is that uh, uh, science which was already an open science and it was uh, advancing science was one of the most uh, uh, important uh, objectives of the science as social institution. Uh, science uh, uh, from uh, science as public good was a very much important uh, value in terms of that. Uh, in, the, in the globalized era from science as public good we have gone into science as the market good. You know, then the whole conflict between the open science and the intellectual property rights have come up because the whole secrecy as a kind of a fundamental value of the scientific product or uh, innovation was accepted, you know. So uh, I am of the view that uh, we can't reject either that domain or we can't reject the, this domain, you see. Both the domains are very, very important. 
uh, I remember to have listened to Professor Arunachalam. Basically, he was talking about the in terms of the publications, in terms of the whole journals, you know, where the government of India rightly going into uh, promoting in terms of the open science, keeping the journals as a part of the scientific commons or whatever it is, you know. The same thing will have to be uh, uh, at the end of the day, if you look in terms of the various other institutions, there is nothing called a free lunch. You see, at the uh, you need to account uh, in terms of the whole thing. So somewhere you need to develop a level playing field between market good and public good. You see, Be, you see, because there's a whole huge section of the Indian population which is the underprivileged sections of the society, the whole SME sector and the whole small institutions. Uh, they cannot afford the kind of the. Uh, uh, this thing always there is going to be a market failure uh, paradigm operating over there. So the uh, so the, the, so the, it, it it is it is for the uh, government to create this kind of a level playing field uh, between market good and uh, public good and how it is done in different institutions. Uh, we are already doing it in publications, you know, where Arunachalam, people like Arunachalam and other people are already working on terms of the whole thing. Uh, it could be done in terms of the whole CSIR. CSIR should not be seen only as a, a market good and the investment factor. Uh, the whole CSIR should be seen as a long term insurance for the small and medium scale enterprises, you see. And there, there's a whole, we are, we, are, we are doing it in terms of uh, uh, agriculture research. We have to do that. Uh, in terms of uh, whole thing. So somewhere I think we need to create a level playing field and that uh, manifest in different forms in different institutions one has to take in terms of the whole case studies. The second issue which you have to, uh, raised in terms of the whole R&D investment uh, and, uh, uh, and our inabilities in terms of collecting the da relevant data uh, what basically you are trying to hint at is that no, we are uh, investing into R&D factors, uh, but we are uh, not able to collect the data and so that it is looking that it is 0.7% or 0.8%. Okay, giving a, given a concession uh, to that, I do agree with you that uh, some of our own students from JNU, CSSP, who was in the manpower division of the Department of Science and Technology, basically I'm talking about Aurora, uh, uh, who, who did uh, uh, a lot of studies, who himself has uh, uh, made it uh, known that uh, 20, more than 20% of the institutions, the DST is not, a, because they will send a questionnaire and uh, uh, only 60, 70, 80% of the questionnaire come, the rest is not followed it up. So assuming a kind of a concession that it's another, let us put neither 0.15% or 0.2%, even if you put it uh, there, it will go up only up to 0.1%, uh, you see, which is not sufficient. Still, you're talking in terms of the whole, uh, this thing. You see, the organizations which are taking money, I, told, I talked about 150% of the uh, R&D uh, tax uh, exemptions are there. Now, the more than 10 companies are taking huge amounts of money, uh, 150%. Whether they're doing testing and analysis, whether they're doing quality control and showing it as R&D, now who has to evaluate it? Now, people will evaluate it if there is a penal underpinning. If I'm a company, I'm taking 150% uh, tax off from the investments I've made, say, maybe one crore or two crores. And if, if if I don't do, my company will be out of the business. So you need to have a, a penal underpinning. That's what I said that uh, in South Korea, there are more than 20 SNT laws. If you see from the last two and a half decades, how these SNT laws are operating in countries like South Korea. So from 80% of the public R&D, GERD funding in South Korea in the 70s and the 80s, today it has come down to 20%. Because with the whole private sector coming into the whole R&D, this whole innovation policy measures will have to be put into practice. That is, that's uh, one aspect of it. Other aspect of it, definitely there is a data problem. You know, the, I, I think uh, the whole uh, data collection process of the DST need to be revamped drastically. 
You see, I completely agree with you that there are several institutions which are doing good R and D work, which is not uh, being tapped, which is not being captured in the R and D statistics. Could be the possible. Say, for instance, uh, the whole ICT software is not uh, declared as R and D. Why? Companies like so, uh, uh, like Satyam, companies like uh, Infosys, companies like Tata Consultancy Services are putting huge amounts of money into software. Why it should be seen only as a service? Tata, Tata Consultancy and Infosys has more than 200 million to 500 million consultancies. You see, you, the, the, the 80, 90 percent of the ADO products are developed in Noida. They are branded somewhere in US. You see, they are branded in Silicon Valley. So, you know, there's a whole, why not? I think software is a good example. The lot of the software you need to relook into uh, what means R and D and the whole R and D definitions will have to be seen in a new perspective. That's what I would respond. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishna. Okay. Uh, now we are actually coming close to the end of the series, uh, this lecture, and uh, we have time for just one very quick question. So can I invite uh, Lev Shikataria? Can you please turn on your audio and ask your question? Uh, thanks, Pragya. I hope I'm audible. And thank you so much, Professor Krishna. Yeah. Um, I, my question is related to, to the previous one, but uh, maybe I will just frame it a bit different. So you did mention somewhere in your talk about scaling up and then Jen, and then you had mentioned about Arvind Eye Care and uh, other things. Uh, so, you know, when I look at uh, the green revolution or the white revolution, I do see that India was really, really uh, successful, at least on those two instances as far as scaling up is concerned. But in these other cases, we have not been able to, you know, really, we haven't really succeeded. And especially with these new technologies also like 5G you mentioned and you mentioned about smart cities and other things too. So uh, is the reason simply that the technology level used, uh, used in white and green revolution was, you know, really low technologies and these other ones are really high technology and because of uh, this uh, high technology uh, sectors, that's why we have not been able to scale up or are there many more reasons for that? Uh, so that's my main question. And maybe a uh, more focused question is that, uh, you know, there might be some hundred reasons for this, but what could be the levers that we can use uh, to make this change more, uh, you know, impactful if we really want to scale up in these other areas? So what, what, should, what should be those levers that we need to really turn? Thanks, Professor Krishna. Yeah, uh, there are uh, uh, different issues uh, which are there. Uh, well, with regard to the Green Revolution, uh, see, uh, the Green Revolution technology, which was equipment, which was the seeds, which was the kind of the fertilizers, which was the kind of the technology which went in at that particular point of time. Now, Swaminathan you know, talked about second Green Revolution, you see. And the second green revolution, he also, then there are people which are talked about agriculture need to be looked from a inno innovation systems perspectives, you see. And uh, when you, when you, when you, when you see it from a innovation systems perspective, then what you do is that you plot uh, different actors who are involved in the system in that particular region, and then try to see that how the system is working or not. It's something like organism. If one part of your body of organism is not working, then the whole system becomes uh, dysfunctional. You see, that is where the system analysis is very becomes very important. So now, if you're looking in terms of the whole second green revolution, so, so there are various other things, including the various issues raised by the farmers, including the whole systems, we, uh, uh, plotting the different actors which are there and the needs and the demands and to look into where, where uh, uh, the whole Swaminathan Foundation itself has a number of, if you look into the whole uh, literature and the publications which they have done, fantastic insights which are there. It's already, you know, 
uh, there's a lot of knowledge is already there, you know, uh, so that knowledge could be just picked up and try to uh, use it. There is no need to reinvent again, you know, in terms of the whole uh, thing. Uh, in terms of the whole thing, and the same is with the green revolution, uh, the white revolution. Now, if you see that, what uh, if you look into the Amul, it's the networks of innovation. You see, it's basically, the, and you see, uh, there are more than uh, hundred uh, technological and institutional and uh, uh, innovations which went into the whole Amul network, and. Uh, uh, in terms of packaging, in terms of uh, chilling, in terms of mini chilling plants, in terms of increasing the uh, storage life. So, you know, there are the it's because it's a cooperative sector and already a system is already built into it. The whole systemic view is already built into the cooperative sector. So you will find there uh, you can uh, uh, use it for the other kind of the uh, uh, sectors of the green revolution. Uh, I would say that and uh, stop there in terms of the whole thing. The other things you talked about the scale up. You see, the scale up, scaling up, and the the kind of the institutions. If you if you look in terms of the whole uh, regional and the rural uh, development, see institutions like Barefoot College, National Innovation Foundation, Anibi Network of Anil Gupta, and. Uh, uh, various in, in, organi successful organizations, Gandhian in, uh, successful organizations are already there. Why today uh, grassroots innovations and the uh, uh, Anil Gupta, who is located in Indian Institute of Management in Ahmedabad, which is our leading management institution, Hanibi uh, Network is successful. Why? Because there is an intermediary institution called the National Innovation Foundation, where DST has put up money into it and where other other departments have uh, put money into it. Achha. Today, uh, uh, so what I am trying to hint at is you need to build intermediary organizations. Intermediary organizations between the needs and demands of that particular rural sector and the formal institutions like IITs or IAMs or something. You know, we all belong to IASC and JNU and Delhi University. Uh, we are all ivory tower people, you see. We don't want to soil our hands, you know. So accept that. Accept that we are ivory tower people. Accept that there's a criticism that we don't want to go and work in the villages. But the policy people will have to build the intermediary institutions where IITs could be linked up, CSR could be linked up to the needs and demands of those village institutions like the National Innovation Foundation, which is an intermediary institution, which is a classic example that why Anil Gupta... Hanibi Network is a successful organization. They have more than 2,000 technologies they have documented. Many of them, they have intellectual property rights they have uh, developed, you see. And, the, and, and they also innovated a new model of uh, intellectual property rights that the rents generated from the commercialization of those patenting goes back to the communities, you see. It's a kind of a new model they have developed in terms of. You know, besides that point, what I'm trying to make is that that you can't ask the IITs and the CSR and these ivory tower people to go to close down what China has done in the barefoot kind of a system in the 60s in the Cultural Revolution to work in the rural areas. They will not do it, and it is not right also. But you can build those intermediary institutions. You know, I can go and spend one 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 uh, six months in somewhere there with adequate facilities, I can give my knowledge and skills and those needs and demands of those institutions. Say somebody, a university could be linked up, IITs could be linked up, uh, have a center in Muradabad and work on the brass institutions in, and uh, try to upgrade them to the, uh, from their 50 years old dyeing and casting technology. You know, uh, uh, so similarly, uh, somebody can go to Mirad, the knowledge institutions could be worked out. So the intermediary institutions have to be created in them. Only then you will be able to, only then you can do uh, this thing. Scaling up is a, is a kind of, uh, that's another problem that there are successful models. I talked about Barefoot College. I talked about uh, uh, in Thelonia, there is a Barefoot College. The two campuses of 400 people uh, operate with 100% solar energy. They have thousands of women who are not educated, who are not this thing. They have trained for uh, solar pumps and solar lamps and solar devices. How, how did they do that? You see, 
so you have to go and see you have to that then why it is not scaled up why kapat has not put money into barefoot college you have to ask this question you see why certain institutions are so successful why jaipur foot you have, you learned they have supplied thousands and thousands and thousands to of uh, uh, prosthetic legs to afghanistan and iraq and uh, this thing they uh, they produce something with uh, uh, equivalent to 40 dollars or 50 dollars of the same kind of a prosthetic uh, uh, device of leg artificial leg is available for 10000 dollars in us you see they are entering into uh, stanford and mit to develop uh, electronic hand now you see from jaipur foot they are now going into electronic hand or something like that so you know there are uh, a kind of uh, so uh, so you have to ask a question that why the government of india has completely neglected barefoot college and jaipur foot and seva and uh, uh, grassroots innovations like sunny bee network they could have been a model to the uh, uh sme policies so researchers and economists should ask this question science policy people should ask this question they are successful 30 or 40 years uh, they are operating and they have this you know there is nothing called a free lunch there it's all see if, if, uh, you you go uh, now who's there's an organization which is uh, you know uh, the sanitary pads uh, developed in the tamil nadu even before that uh, barefoot college has done that with 120th of the price of procter and gamble you see so there are kind of a success stories are there and the only the policy link up that's what i said we need a paradigmatic change in terms of the whole policy link up we need to really establish national innovation system and the rural innovation systems so only then you can look for certain success which is should be the agenda policy agenda i mean thank you yeah Thank you, Professor Krishna, for that uh, very thorough answer. And uh, thank you for your talk. And thank you, all the participants, for joining and for this very active engagement. So uh, before we close this session, uh, let's uh, have a group photo. So I would request everybody to turn on their videos for uh, some time. Uh, Suresh, can you please uh, take a group picture, please? Sure. Let everyone turn on the cameras. Done, thank you. Thank you, Suresh, and uh, thank you, Professor Krishna, again for this wonderful session. Uh, with this, I think we can close today's yeah. session. Yeah. Thank uh, you very much. And uh, if you have further questions, and if any of the uh, participants, uh, uh, one is that uh, which I have already sent this paper, India at seventy-five, mm -hmm. to Suresh and others. Uh, okay. You can look into it, and if you have further okay. questions on it, you can use my email. I will be ready to answer. Okay, sure. Thank look you forward. so much. I look Thank forward. You. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you very Bye. much, Professor Krishna. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye. Bye.